Welcome everybody to the third installment of the LTR visual media series. Um, this has been a really great series of presentations from uh, people that do science communication through all sorts of different uh, visual media. Um, so Kelso is a, is a photographer, videographer, and podcast host, and maybe some other things. Um, but we've had uh, other presentations from uh, from graphic designers and, and people that work in, in, in print publishing and whatnot. Um, these are all recorded and I'll drop the link in the chat. You can, if you missed the first two, you can watch those um, on that webpage. Uh, but this, this series has really been uh, a, a product of our graduate student committee. Um, so we have a, a graduate students across the network who, who meet every once in a while to, to run events like this. And they've, they've done a really great job in, in, in putting this together and, um, and pulling in some great speakers and, and making it all run smoothly. So. Big shout out to them, and and we're really excited to get get uh, you know wrap this up with a with a great presentation from Kelso. Um, so uh, yeah, for just as an aside uh, to keep up to date with events like this, um, if you don't already follow the LTR newsletter, that's a great place to uh, to to learn about events that happen all across the network. Uh, you know, we're on social media, pretty much everyone, Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky, Mastodon, LinkedIn, you name it, we're on it. Um, and we post most events there too. So uh, give us a follow and, and definitely keep an eye out for things like this in the future. Stuff's happening across the network all the time. Um, and with that, I'll pass it to Shating for an introduction. Thanks, Gabe. And thank you, Kelso, for joining us today. So Kelso Harper is a science journalist and multimedia producer and many, many <laughs> hats. Um, currently, they're running the vertical video production as Scientific American. So they have a degree in chemistry uh, from Johns Hopkins and science writing from MIT. And I would love for you to, uh, if you like what you see today, I would love for you to go to their website and then they're on their socials, check out the work that they're doing. It's been really like I'm really impressed following your career so far so it's you're doing great <laughs> so um for audience members we'll hold the questions until the end of the presentation but if you are thinking of them just um maybe write it down and then put it in the chat uh we want to have a good discussion at the end so now I'll turn to Kelso Thanks so much, Shating. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, LTR folks. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, it's been really cool to learn a little bit more about the Long-Term Ecological Research Network um, and the work that you're doing and super important and exciting. And I'm happy to help you maybe communicate it even more broadly than you already are. Um, so yes, hi, I'm Kelso Harper. I'm a multimedia editor, which means I do a lot of different things, um, uh, photo, video, audio, all across. But this presentation, I'll, I'll focus on the visual aspects, photo and video. Um, at Scientific American, I'll talk a little bit more about my specific roles, but I essentially work on short documentaries um, on our podcast occasionally, and now running our vertical video or social video uh mini production department, which is basically turning our science content into uh, TikToks, reels, shorts, videos like that. So uh, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit of how did I end up here, then we'll go through some image and video composition basics, and then end by talking a little bit more about the field of science communication in general. So let's see, well, there we go. Um, so I, as Gabe mentioned, or maybe it was Xia Ting, um, I began as a chemist. Um, I studied chemistry at Johns Hopkins University, did some research there. Um, I really enjoyed it, but I kind of accidentally took a science writing course where I learned about the world of science communication and science journalism and realized I loved the breadth that I would get in, in that kind of path. And I really enjoyed learning about all areas of, areas of science and telling all of my friends about it all the time. And I didn't realize that was a job, that you could just tell other people about science as your job. So that kind of led me away from research and into uh, journalism and communication. Um, I uh, <laughs> was just going to note that this person's not wearing PPE. That's just where my chemistry brain just went. Um, <laughs> just a stock photo. 
Um, but I, uh, towards the end of my college career, when I realized I wanted to make this transition, I began writing for the Johns Hopkins, um, uh, university newspaper, just wrote a couple articles that gave me some clips in it to apply for my first internship, which was at Brookhaven National Lab, which is a department of energy lab on Long Island. This is where I like had my first science communication experience, began writing stories about science, um, professionally realized I continued to like it and wanted to go further into this field. It's also when I had my first opportunity to work with photographers and videographers. Um, it, it spurred some inspiration to pick up a camera in my last year of college and start playing around with it and seeing how I could start using visuals in addition to words uh, to communicate science. I then, after I graduated college, still didn't really have a clear direction, I ended up at this wilderness center in northern Minnesota. Um, residency is in quotes because I was mostly doing carpentry and helping around uh, the wilderness center, but that's where I actually had my first opportunity to work alongside a, a videographer and video editor and begin actually using the camera to make videos um, and learn some rudimentary editing skills. And that's, I was just hooked. Um, I knew I wanted to use video in addition to all these other formats um, to communicate science. So after that, honestly, freelancing is a lot of cobbling things together, especially at the start. Um, I knew I wanted to uh, begin, a, begin a freelance career, but I didn't really know where to begin. Um, I picked up a gig writing educational articles for the National Geographic Resource Library, which sounds fancier than it is. Um, I mean, it's a great resource. Uh, excellent, excellent resource. I would recommend, especially for teachers. But I was doing that on the side, but that wasn't enough to support me. So I, you know, I worked part-time at a pizza place. I began taking photos for that pizza place um, and uh, doing that for other local restaurants in my town, just basically trying, trying to find ways to pull out my camera and get paid if I, if possible. Um, and just on my, in my free time, make starting to make stuff because I knew I needed the practice. I didn't really have the formal training, but I wanted to go into this field. Um, all of that did add up to enough materials. Um, some, some projects I never published, but still went in this application for the science scientific American video journalism internship. Um, this six month internship uh, was basically my first introduction into uh, into science journalism and video journalism uh, and the world of it and how that ends up how that works, how it looks. Um, and uh, I will say that in the field of science communication, science journalism, um, uh, if scientists are interested in transitioning, internships play a big role and are a huge help. And I'll talk a little bit more about where you can find opportunities if you're interested in something like that. Um, I then ended up going back to school uh, at the MIT graduate program in science writing. Um, additionally, if you are interested in a transition to a career in science communication, this grad program is a year long and it's fully funded. You get paid to get a master's degree. Um, and that's pretty rare. And it was a really good program. Um, you'll notice that these are a lot of visuals, but it was a science writing program. Why is that? Um, basically, at every step in my career, and especially in grad school, I took as many opportunities as possible to add photo or video into whatever work I was doing. So I part-time worked at the MIT astrophysics uh, department and offered to make these different labs videos about the work they were doing. This is what you're seeing here. It taught me a lot about how to convey complex information in a short amount of time and convey it visually. Um, it was a really good training ground for me. I then did more cobbling of things together. We were talking about this at the beginning of the call. I ended up down in Chile to do some um, work with MIT. They work with a lot of scientists down there. So I was helping communicate their work. Um, I uh, made a couple short documentaries based on my thesis work at MIT, picked up some script writing gigs. A lot of freelancing is, is, is finding a, a mix of consistent work and um, one-off exciting work to uh, support yourself. On the left is a frame of one of my first hosted videos. Uh, I, I, I was picked up as a contractor with Wired for about six months as a social video producer. Um, and that was my first time making social videos. Uh, and so I learned a lot, especially because no one had really done that role at, at Wired. And so uh, once again, trial by far, fire, <laughs> lots of trial and error. Um, but uh, that all of this added up to my work now at Scientific American, where I am a multimedia editor. On the left are some stills from short documentaries that we shot last year. 
Um, so that's a part of my work. Those end up being around 10 minutes. Um, uh, on the right is a, a still of our, our podcast uh, a logo. I was a producer editor more last year until I transitioned to what you see in the middle, uh, being a host and producer editor for our uh, TikTok, which we launched last August. Um, we post those videos on Instagram, reels and shorts, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, and later on about how scientists can get involved on these platforms and how I think it's really valuable for um, experts to, to uh, provide some of their expertise on platforms like these where there might often be misinformation and things like that. So let's, enough about me, we're done with that. Let's go into, oh wait, no, we're not that done yet. <laughs> Actually, this is more about vertical video generally. Um, taking a moment to talk about the different formats that we play with at Scientific American. Um, we'll do skits, like you see on the left. We'll do more basic explainer videos using a TikTok green screen, some, talking about some image behind us to cover latest research that's coming out. We work with independent creators, you see in the third frame, um, to talk about anything from you know math, science, or space, biology cover all sorts of topics. And the last slide, I just wanted to note that um, on these platforms, even if you want to um, become a creator of some kind or share your work, you don't necessarily have to be on screen as a host if you're not comfortable with that. Um, photo carousels like this one would do really well. You can make um, videos of like photos out from the field or, or collection, collected videos from the field with just narration. So um, there's a lot of different ways to participate in this ecosystem. So you've pretty much Oops. always tested the efficiency <laughs> of your peer. So I just wanted to show you a few examples of the work that we do. Um, uh, the first is a kind of higher production value version of what we do. It's still not, you know, the fanciest, um, but uh, it's one of our skits that we might, and this is just to convey a topic, um, a, a recent research finding, and we'll do this for all sorts of things. So I'll go ahead and let this play. So you've pretty much always tested the absorbency of your period products with water-based solutions. But as we all know, blood is thicker than water, so these estimates aren't entirely accurate. Scientists finally tested period product absorbency with actual blood and found that lots of your estimates were way off. Some of your products like period underwear could not hold as much blood as advertised, but others like heavy flow pads and menstrual discs could handle far more. These inaccuracies make it hard for doctors to diagnose heavy menstrual bleeding, which is a symptom of many serious medical conditions. But human blood is in short supply, and it takes special training to handle. There is synthetic blood, but it's much more expensive than the saline y'all usually use. Wait, wait, where are you going? This is important! Y'all are going to keep using that Baja Blast looking stuff, aren't you? Typical. So, yep, <laughs> that's one of those uh, skit videos. Uh, this is a higher lift thing. You know, um, um, we used a green screen. Our editor is experienced with, you know, putting multiple people in the same frame. Um, but that's just to kind of give a sense of how we break down information and put it into a less than a minute video to get some key information across um, grab people's attention and make science more accessible to the general public. Um, the idea being that anyone could watch that video and understand what the key finding is and why it's important. Um, and But to sh give an example of something that someone can do really easily on a walk uh, uh, <laughs> or wherever you are, um, this second video is actually one of our most, our first videos that went uh, really viral. Um, and it's just, a simple explainer responding to another creator who had a question. Um, and I think this is a great way for scientists and other experts to get involved on uh, in, on social media, media platforms is if there's a video going around that has wrong information or um, you can add more information to, it, you can respond pretty simply and, and correct that misinformation. So here's this video. Can someone scientifically explain to me why it only rains on Fridays and Saturdays in New York City? Is there, is there a reason to Hi, Karen from Scientific American here. So what's happening right now is what meteorologists are calling an atmospheric traffic jam. And what this means is that there is a region of high pressure over Canada right now that's blocking storms from moving north. And it's not uncommon for weather patterns to follow a cycle. But what is a coincidence is that these storms coming in from the Pacific are coming in in waves every six to seven days. So it just happened to start on a Saturday and 
it's really just an unfortunate periodic blocking pattern that is ruining our weekend plans. So meteorologists say that the block is over, but it's still an active pattern. So next weekend's weather is going to be a combination of both atmospheric factors and luck. So that shows you a wide range of uh of the types of videos that one can make about science on the platform. There's even more. I'm going to skip the third example just for the sake of time. But this, the third example is just essentially photos from a research paper um, about this gl new glowing plant. It's a very cool plant. Um, and just kind of walking people through the key points, key findings, um, and why is it cool? Why is it interesting? And why is it important? Um, and yeah, so let's let's keep it moving. So you pretty much always have there we go. Um, on to photo basics, uh, image composition. This is this any of this information will also apply to composing uh, images for video. Um, but let's just start with photos. Um, I'm gonna start from kind of square one, which is the rule of thirds. It's often the first thing you learn about photo composition. Um, it's essentially if you if you break your image up into thirds vertically and horizontally, um, those four intersection points around the center of the image are great places to put your subject. Um, and this is just a simple rule of thumb to more easily create visual balance in an image um, to give your eye somewhere to go. I think that's through all of these composition basics. Um, it's about like, how do you get someone's eye to travel seamlessly through an image, sort of nudging them in the right direction to go? Where are they supposed to be looking? Can they draw a nice path with their eyes through the image? And um, the rule of thirds helps give you your, your basics. It's not something uh, that you have to use every time, but if you're thinking about an image, not sure, how to frame it exactly, try this and it, and it might give it a little extra something. Up next is similar to the rule of thirds, um, you can think about where you might wanna place your horizon in, in an image. Um, ten, uh, vision, uh, images tend to be more visually interesting if the horizon line is on one of those thirds, on the upper third or lower third line in that rule of thirds image. Um, so it just essentially, breaks up your image and, and it tends to give a little bit more motion, a little more visual intrigue. Um, but with any of these recommendations, they're not rules, they're suggestions and help you when you're, especially when you're starting out, but they rules can be broken. Like I love this image. It's of my sister. Um, I love this image so much, but the horizon is smack dab in the middle. Um, but just because that doesn't inherently mean it's a problem. I personally love how it creates a, a vanishing point behind her. Um, uh, so all of these are suggestions. They're really helpful when you're first starting out to follow these rules so that you can understand what you like, what you don't like, and how you might want to break them. Uh, leading lines is another classic um, image composition basic. Uh, you'll see that the lines in the street and the line of this concrete wall, um, as well as the like uh, parking spots, create a line directly to the subject. And another way of telling your eye exactly where to go um, and giving uh, an image more depth. Similar to on uh, a similar vein, uh, speaking of depth, um, depth of field is a way of talking about what, like how <clears throat> it, a photo with a shallower depth of field, the subject is further in focus. On the, on the left, this image has a very shallow depth of field. So the person is in focus, the background is blurred. On the right, this landscape image, most of the photo is in focus. So it has a wider depth of field. Um, having a shallower depth of field, like on the left, uh, often gives imagery a little bit more you know, depth and, and quality. I think also because fancier cameras tend to be able to achieve a shallower depth of field. And so images or videos with a shallower depth of field tend to look a little bit more polished, but that's not to say that there aren't places where you'd want a wider depth of field. Like the image on the right, there was so much beautiful detail all across this landscape that I wanted to keep all of it or most of it in focus so that you can see everything going on there. But a shallow depth of field really draws focus to your subject and creates more depth in the image typically. Light. Oh my gosh. Photographers 
are obsessed with light. Um, and that's why, and we're obsessed with the golden hour. So sunrise, sunset, you're always going to get, or almost always going to get better light if you're taking photos in the morning or at night, or sorry, first thing in the morning or last thing before the sun sets. Um, top down lighting and overhead lighting creates a lot of harsh, harsh shadows. Um, and it doesn't, and it takes some depth away from your image images. Sometimes a cloudy day can be nice. It gives a nice diffuse light to get eliminate some of those harsh shadows. But like you see in these images, the the light really makes the difference. On the left, the this landscape light paints where your eye is supposed to go. Um, it adds much more depth, and it and it creates a little bit more of a place for your eye to go than if it were just all one shade of light. If it was all shaded or all bright. Um, and on the right, you can see this this gorgeous backlit cactus in the Mojave. Um, it just it essentially makes the cactus glow and pop out from the rest of its surroundings. I'll note that in this image and other images, you'll see it, it backlit, lit from behind, um, which is a beautiful thing. Photographers love a, a lot of backlit imagery. It can be tougher with a phone camera um, without a higher quality camera that can capture a wider range of light. So I would say try it, play with it, but some it might be a little bit harder if you're just working with a phone or something like that. But we'll go through how to take great images with your phone as well. Uh, just reiterating that light is so important and your image, if choosing just a different time of day to take your image can improve its image quality. Um, and so get out there in the early morning or, or, in, or in the golden hour in the evening. Action. So giving your, if you, it's nice when a, an a image can tell a story and it is alive in a way. Um, I like this image because it just it feels adventurous to me. And I like, and I'm like wondering where that person is pointing and what they're talking about. It's another good place to talk about um, having leading space. Um, it's, to, you, it's nice to have extra space in front of wherever a person is looking or pointing um, instead of like, if I'm looking this direction, ha cropping it too close to my face this way. Um, other kinds of motion are great in an image, a wave crashing, wind blowing someone's hair. It just makes a photo feel more alive. Angles. Um, tr I think if you're trying to get into photos, pho photography at all, trying new angles makes such a big difference. Try going, looking at an object from above, from below, from laying on the ground, um, uh, changing your perspective can really make the difference between, uh, uh, a basic image and a really interesting image. I went into my backyard and just snapped some photos the other morning. I wanted to show examples with a phone camera. Um, and this is just like, if I wanted to, these these convey basic information. You're like, okay, there's a plant. There's some, some uh, dandelions. Great. But it's not giving the same amount of visual intrigue. This was just standing there, the easiest photo I could take. But then I got got up closer and I played with different angles, looking at it from above. I, I moved the pot closer to the edge of the bricks to create these leading lines that draw your eye back to the plant. Um, so it's just it shows that you can you can give a lot more character to an image when you try um, shooting it from a different angle. Um, I'll note that the image on the right uh, was shot with portrait mode, which a lot of cameras have now. And that sort of digitally, artificially creates a shallow depth of field. Um, normally you get a shallower depth of field by using a different type of lens on your camera. Um, but on your phone, you, it, it just automatically blurs out the background and senses where the subject is. Uh, this is can be a re really nice thing to use to create more depth in your image and, and up the quality. Um, I'll note that sometimes it doesn't do a great job, but you can adjust how much it's blurring the background. Um, so if it looks like it's blurring too much or not enough, you can get into the settings and play with that. And similarly with those dandelions, I just like laid in the grass and got as close to the dandelion as possible. The second image I used um, my three times zoom on my camera to get really close and to create um, uh, that shallower depth of field, which you'll usually, you'll get from zooming in. Um, and this also is a good example of light. Once again, that other plant was in the shaded uh, corner of my backyard. And this was in the sunny part, early morning light. It just, brightens things up and gives things such dimension. 
And on to editing your images, um, a little bit of editing can go a long way with, and these are two just photo, um, phone photos I took the other day. It's spring in New York City. Um, and just playing a little bit with your color, uh, the color of an image can make it really pop and stand out. Um, so my basics usually will be to increase contrast a little bit, increase saturation a little bit. Um, but I would really recommend if you are trying to edit an image, play with all of the sliders that you're given. Um, move it all the way to the right, all the way to the left, bring it slowly back to center and see what effects it, it is having on your image because it's not going to be the same for every image. Um, you might want to bring shadows up uh, for which is just you know the shadows of an image bring them up brighter in some images or darker in another um and yeah I would just recommend playing around but a, typically a little bit of more contrast ensuring that there's enough exposure which means just the brightness of your image um uh is it's either bright enough or not too bright um playing with your black point that's basically at what point does a color look to be black? Um, sometimes that can create a little bit more depth in your image, but you don't want to take it too far. Um, and upping the saturation typically helps a little bit, but not, not doing it so much that it looks artificial. Um, I also added a slight vignette to this image, which is basically the shading around, uh, around the edges of an image. I wouldn't go too far with this because then it starts looking like an Instagram filter from 2008. But um, once again, play with it try a little bit um, and, a, and just like a minute of editing on a photo before you share it can make a big difference. I would also ask yourself if you're sharing an image, who is viewing it and how are they viewing it? Because honestly, this has shaped the way that I, I take and share images. So most of the time people are probably looking at an image on their phone. Um, unfortunately, landscaped fo landscape photos look very get very small and don't tend to look as good on on a phone um, because you just lose a lot of the detail these were just phone photos I took the other night um and I love I really love this wide photo um and I think it's nice on a des desktop but um when you shrink it down it just loses a lot of the detail it's not bad but I will say that nowadays um if I'm looking to post an image on Instagram or share an image that someone might use, see on a phone, I will almost always shoot it vertically and I will almost always crop it four by five, which is the largest crop you can have on Instagram. So uh, think about where exactly they're viewing an image and how they might view it best. On to video. Um, I mean, let me know if I'm going too fast. Uh, I guess uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on, uh, I went a little bit quickly through uh, through that, but um, we can go into more detail on any of those at the end. But all of those composition um, basics will apply to video as well. So I'm just going to focus more on video specific recommendations here. So three main things to think about when you're filming a video, light, sound, and stability. How is your image being lit? What, is, or what are we hearing? And um, is it shaky or still? And I think these small small changes to each of these can really improve the quality of a video. So let's say these recommendations I'm gonna mostly tailor to social video, um, but I think a lot of these things will still apply to landscape video or like a YouTube video, things like that. So for example, if you are shooting a landscape B-roll, um, oh, and B-roll means uh, it's the <laughs> extra imagery that you have that you overlay Let's say that you're you're filming an interview. Um, B-roll is what you lay on top of it to kind of explain the concepts that someone is talking about. Um, it's just not, it's secondary footage, but it's still very important. It's just not the main track of footage, if that makes sense. But let me know if that's still unclear. Um, but let's say you wanted to host a video and talk about your science. Um, I would highly recommend, first, first things first, find a window. I film a lot of my videos next to my bedroom window because it just gives you nice diffuse light you want to have it on your face predominantly a little bit of shadow like you see on my face right now is okay um but you don't want to have your back turned to the light like this frame on the left um the light from the window is coming and not really hitting the front of her face and so it's just a little bit too in shadow um but on the right we put 
uh, Lee, our space and physics editor, um, right in front of the window so that his face was really lit up um, beautifully. And uh, uh, so I think that's it's really important and also really easy generally. Um, if you can't find a window, find a bright lamp, um, ideally one with a shade that's kind of diffuse, but uh, a lamp is better than your top-down light. Um, Top down light creates shadows under your eyes and under your neck and just makes uh, images look a little bit harsher. Um, so I would avoid top down lighting. A, a lamp or a ring light or a window are your best bets. Sound. You know, when I was first starting making videos, I think sound was a thing I I didn't realize I didn't realize how important sound was when I was first starting out. Um, both the quality of someone's speaking sounds, but also ambient sounds and music. Um, it can really change the quality of it of a video and change the feel of it, the emotional impact. Um, on the left are just some simple recommendations for if you if you were looking to make videos more regularly. These are really basic tools that can improve your sound quality. The top one is called a shotgun microphone. You could attach it to your phone. It's This one's very small, pretty cheap. I think it's like 60 bucks. Um, and that's really good for like ambient sounds. It, like let's say you're going to a research site and you want to just collect the sounds of the research site or someone doing, you know, um, doing something in particular, you collect the sounds of their action. Um, otherwise you have uh, la a lapel mic, it literally clips to your lapel. That's the second one. Or honestly, a, a trend on, on TikTok and on social video is teeny tiny microphones that you can get for like $20. And even that can make the difference. Otherwise, just try to film in a quiet place if you're trying to film yourself talking. Um, or just be sure to capture the sound and use the sound of the ambient environment wherever you are. And I, I just ran into this video like yesterday. I just thought, it seemed relevant to the long-term ecological research for F, uh, network. And I I really think that sound makes a difference here for this video that went viral of just this uh, sharp-tailed grouse. Um, so I'm just gonna play it without sound and then with sound just to kind of portray this. So you're like, I mean, it's a cool video without sound. Cool. I mean, who doesn't love a sharp-tailed grouse lek dancing? Awesome. But I think, but sound, tells you where you are and gives you so much information about what's happening, what this bird is doing and what's going on around you. Yep, yeah, so sound is very important. It changes everything. It uh, gives you so much information and changes the emotional impact of, of your video. There we go. Similarly, I just did this quick little test in my backyard just to, to convey this once more. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm gonna play the video without sound, with the ambient sound, and then with a little bit of music I overlaid just to convey the differences. It's like, it's a pretty sunrise, you know, without sound. but it doesn't give you much. You're missing out on at least half of the information. Once we hear it with sound, it tells you kind of what time of day it is. It tells you that you're in a city. It tells you that it's springtime. So let's listen. It just, it just gives you, it, it makes it a real place and gives you information. Um, but you can also add music to your videos and that can change the emotional tone. Um, I'll be honest, one of the hardest things oftentimes is, is choosing the right music for a video um, because it's so hard to hit that tone. But when it's, when it's right, it really works. My backyard has never been so ethereal, truly. Um, just a little bit of little track makes a difference. Let's see. And finally, stability. Um, a shaky video, you know, it can it can work, but it's better if it's a little less shaky. 
Um, the easiest way to deal with this is by getting yourself a little tripod to put your phone or camera on. Um, and you can film yourself that way, film an ambient environment that way. You could also get something like what you see in the middle, which is a, a little phone rig. We, we actually use these specific ones uh, at Scientific American. You could attach a light and a, and a microphone if you wanted to, but it just either both allows you to mount, mount it on any tripod and gives you a little bit more stability. But even if you're just holding a phone and shooting a video, um, make sure, don't hold it out far from you with one hand. Put two hands on it and hold it close to your body. And in fact, move your body more than you move your hands. And that'll help you create the most stable video possible, even with a, a phone camera. And if you are trying to make a video about your science, um, uh, here are some quick tips about how to do that. Um, these are things that I think about all the time when I'm trying to convey a research paper in one or two or three minutes um, and to a, a lay audience. Um, I first ask myself, what's, what's the key thing I'm trying to convey? And what's the most surprising thing perhaps of, of what I'm trying to tell folks? Those, one of those two things will be what I lead the video with. Um, but at the same time, you don't necessarily want to reveal everything right at the beginning of the video. You want to give folks enough to understand where you're going, but also give them a reason to continue watching the video. So you might pose a question. Um, you might say, wow, this thing is so interesting, but I also learned something else. And you talk about both of those things through the course of video. Um, I also ask, like, what will viewers want to tell someone else what they learn what they learned from this video? What do you think they might tell someone? Um, that might help you understand what to focus on. I'll also, honestly, like, I'll I'll write a script and sleep on it and come back and try to remember, and it'll help me understand what is the most important part of the script, and those details start to pop out. Um, I would say that if as much as possible, break down complex topics. It doesn't mean that you avoid complexity. We deal with complexity and nuance all the time in our videos, but you have to understand where whoever you're trying to reach, meet them at that level and take them every step of the way. And if you're trying to introduce a new concept or a new word, you take the time to explain that word. It's okay if it makes things longer because you want to bring everyone along with you. Um, I'll note that if you are scripting something out, uh, 150 words typically translate to about a minute of speaking time. So keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, with any of these things, just talk to your friends about what it is that you want to tell everyone about or whatever science you're working on. And especially a friend who has no idea what it is you're talking about. That's kind of the best thing. I do this all the time. Um, I tell my friends about whatever it is that I'm trying to make a video about. And it helps me learn what the, what catches their attention, what they're most excited about, what's confusing, what's common knowledge and what isn't. Um, so uh, talking to other people can make a really big difference and be, be the most informative thing, honestly. Mm -mm. And if you're filming yourself for a video, um, I would recommend remembering about light, sound, and stability. Um, but I, well, I guess my notes are a little bit out of order. First of all, you don't have to be on camera if you want to present your science in video form. You, you don't have to be. You could collect images of whatever you're talking about. Um, you could collect videos of whatever you're talking about and line those up and do a voiceover. Or you could do a photo carousel. Um, you know, you don't have to do hosting if you don't want to host. But at the same time, people love hearing directly from experts. They really do. And uh, if you do want to present yourself on camera as a host, actually genuinely be yourself. Like authenticity is kind of, is a very important thing on these platforms. And it's more important than trying to talk really fast or mimic what you imagine as like a TikTok style video. Um, people really value your authenticity. Um, and I think it also is just more fun that way. If you're trying to talk about something that you care about, talk about it like yourself. Um, if you are doing this, you can uh, take lots of takes. Cuts are okay, um, which, you know, you could film the first 10 seconds of your video and the next 10 seconds of your video and the next 10 seconds of your video on these social platforms. That's not a problem. And in fact, that is just the format. Um, filming a little bit of whatever you're talking about or finding 
video or images online of what you're talking about can be a great way to keep people's attention. So, you know, if you're ex explaining something about a research site or experiment, showing images or videos of that overlaid on top of you talking is really helpful. But overall, have fun doing it. If you're if you're excited about doing it, have fun doing it, you know? Um, and if you wanted to then edit that video, you have um, uh, options available to you within any of these apps, within TikTok, within Reels. I think that um, they can be really useful. They can be limiting. But if you are first time, you've never edited a video before, they're meant to be user-friendly. Maybe watch a YouTube tutorial. Honestly, I learned so much throughout my career from YouTube tutorials. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, and just get a rundown for how you might edit a short video together. Um, I use Adobe Premiere Pro. A lot of folks use that or Final Cut Pro, but there are free editing softwares if you don't want to use in-app software. Um, I started on Lightworks, which is a great free option. But if you're on a Mac, you could also use iMovie. Um, when you're editing, cut to the action. If you have a clip uh, that's 15 seconds long, what's the most interesting five seconds of that clip? Um, where does the action begin? You're not going to wait for the action to start. Where does the action begin? And that's where the best part of your clip should be. Uh, <laughs> the millennial pause is something that um, has been coined recently. Uh, it's essentially like when you start a video or start a phrase, it's that pause before you start talking. So just cut that out. If you're hosting a video, just cut out those extra pauses. Um, play with it, but it doesn't have to be complicated. You could just film yourself talking for two minutes straight or do it in 30 second chunks and line those up. And that's a video. Uh, and you know, if you're interested in any of this, just try it out. Nike cannot keep me from this phrase because it is, even though this is maybe the most cliche slide I've ever uh, made, it is, all of this is so true and has helped me throughout my whole career is just giving my, assigning myself th fun things to do trying it out. Honestly, I have so many unfinished projects, but all of them were useful because I learned along the way. Um, I spent like years just like grabbing my camera and going out at sunset and just taking photos of things all over the place all the time. A lot of them are bad photos. I used, I, you know, I've learned a lot about editing and framing and every, all of these things through just practice and figuring out what I like and what I don't like and um, trying it over and over and over again. Um, and having fun along the way. Okay, all right. So <laughs> zooming back out from these minutia, I hope that was helpful about, you know, image and, and video basics, but what does this look like more broadly in the field of science communication? Because, I mean, you may, may know more than I did at, when I was in science world, but I didn't really realize how the breadth of science communication. Um, it can look a lot of different ways and it happens in a lot of different places. So any science institution, um, universities, research centers, government labs, um, private companies that do science, everyone, ev all of those places have science communicators that they work with. And they also wanna work with scientists to communicate their science and help them communicate their science. In fact, at Brookhaven National Lab, we would work with scientists all the time to help them create uh, an elevator pitch about how to talk about their science um, and probably do classes like this where how do you visually convey your science, um, et cetera. But, um, but there's people who work at all of these institutions as science writers, often science video makers, communicating what is happening in those institutions when research papers come out, et cetera. Um, there's also museums, science centers, and other places where science education happens filled with science communicators. Um, and there's, of course, journalistic outlets like Scientific American, Nature, Science Magazine. I'll be honest, last year was a really rough year for science journalism. Um, a lot of different places uh, were reduced in size or even died. And there's, it's a, it's a tough evolution right now and I'm not really sure how things are gonna shake out, but there are still vibrant careers um, available in science journalism. And also I was kind of told that things were dire when I was trying to get into science journalism. And it's, I think, I think that's just kind of how people talk about it also. Um, there, and there's just lots of non-traditional ways to be in science communication now available. You know, there's science podcasters, there's 
science influencers. There's, you know, you have, can have sub stacks. There's so many ways to be a science communicator and even monetize science communication if you're interested um, uh, more than there's ever been. And that's, I think, why some of these bigger media giants are shrinking because, you know, the where things are, people are getting their information is evolving. Um, but then one of the most important things, I think, is uh, scientists being out in the world and talking about their science over a beer or on Instagram or on their own blog or Substack, um, sharing their work and kind of and making science more transparent and accessible to everyone. Um, if you're interested in learning more about science communication or trying your hand at it, um, I, I got my start at my university newspaper. I know not every university has something like that, um, but it's a great way if your university does have it to try things out and play around. Of course, like I mentioned, you have all these per personal platforms available to you um, that you can try sharing some of your work and just using it as a, you know, a place to play around and, and try new things. Um, there's also online courses in science communication I've linked here. I guess we can share the slides afterwards. Um, our, my ed the editor in chief of Scientific American participated in the science communication education series um, uh, through nature. And I believe most institutions have access to it. So if you wanted to have a full blown course about giving you the basics of science communication, this is an awesome resource. And if you're interested in transitioning from science to science communication, um, there's something called the AAAS Mass Media Fellowship, which is just like such an all-star program. It's specifically for scientists interested in science communication. And it places you at a different, at a, an institution of, uh, a journalistic institution somewhere in the US. And it's a summer internship, get, getting you basically, getting your basics and getting your first clips down um, and introducing you to the world of, of science journalism and science communication. Similarly, there's an amazing program at UC Santa Cruz, which has really good funding as well, in addition to the MIT program. Um, honestly, I would even recommend this more highly, uh, this UC Santa Cruz program for scientists who don't have a lot of experience in journalism and communication, um, because this program is specifically for scientists making that transition and you have to have a science degree. But there's also all these other grad programs. I can't speak as much to the financials and details of those, but they're also available. Um, I'll also leave these other resources here if you wanna learn more. The Open Notebook is amazing. It has um, all sorts of articles and guidebooks for every aspect of science communication and science journalism. Um, you can find so much information there. Similarly, the Night Science Journalism program has a ton of resources specific to journalism. Um, there's a National Association of Science Writers. It's National Association, uh, it's of science writers, but it's also of science communicators more generally, visual, video, audio, et cetera. This is actually where I found a lot of my first freelance gigs. Um, uh, there was a, uh, they do put on an internship fair every year. It's a great way to make new connections. Um, and it's just an excellent all around resource. YouTube, truly half of my career, I feel like I learned through YouTube tutorials, especially for um, learning more about video and, photo and photography because I didn't really have a lot of formal education in that. Um, and then finally, reach out to people, reach out to me, reach out to other folks, ask your questions. I have, at the sense that I have of the field of science communication is that people want to help uh, other folks who are interested in it and sci help scientists communicate their work, et cetera, et cetera. Like I have been pleasantly surprised by um, how welcoming and helpful everyone has been to me. And I think I would love to pass that on and also other people can do that too. And um, that's that's that. That's the presentation. I know I went through some of those things a little quick. So please ask questions and let me know what you're more interested in. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I hope this was helpful. <laughs> Silent clapping. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you so much um, for all the folks that uh, might have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and see if we can get some answers. But as somebody else that's in science communication, despite it being a failing industry, <laughs> rest assured that there are opportunities and jobs still. Uh, there are. People talk a lot of doom and gloom, but 
I think actually institutional SciComm is growing pretty rapidly. A lot of organizations, universities, whatever, are newly seeing the importance of getting their word out. So uh, yeah, definitely. I would totally agree with that. And I think, I think it's just the field is shifting more than anything. And I think, yeah, it is really funny. Cause I, I heard the exact same thing from that science writing professor that I, in my undergrad, they're like, don't, don't do it. I'm like, what? No, is, uh, he, people get jaded over time, <laughs> but I think there's so much opportunity and, um, some, in some ways more than ever. Mm -hmm. And I'll also point out that, uh, a lot of these opportunities are specifically targeted towards graduate students. Um, it seems like there's a lot of, a lot of very specific, uh, and really great, you know, well-paying well opportunities in that space. So if you are still a student, don't wait till you're out to start looking at these things because like the, what is it? The AAAS fellowship, Master like fellowship. the, that's an amazing program and I would love to do it, but I don't qualify because I graduated a couple of years ago. So Um, I'll, I'll ask, a, I have a question to ask, but I also think I'm moderate, moderating the chat. So I'll just say it. Um, as a science communicator, um, how do you find research to cover? Like how much is folks reaching out to you and like you having established relationships with scientists versus like you read their paper or you see a press release and like how important, like as a scientist, maybe who's like interested in science communication, but like doesn't know about doing it themselves. Like how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, there's a few different avenues. I mean, one is just looking at journals and uh, looking at uh, papers that have come out. That's probably the heaviest lift unless you are uh, trying to focus on a very specific field and uh, are only looking at a couple different journals. Um, otherwise, there are these like uh, press release aggregators that we use. Um, one of them is called, one of the biggest ones is called Eureka Alert. Um, I... I think access is limited to like, you have to have recently published some sort of article, um, but you could reach out and see what kind of access is available. Essentially it aggregates um, press releases uh, from all sorts of universities, institutions, all in one place. You can sort by, you know, what type of research you're looking for um, and it keeps you up to date. I think the, the special access you need actually is just for embargoed papers, which just means here's a press release for a paper that's coming out in one week. Um, and you as a journalist uh, get to see it beforehand, but other people don't get to see it yet. And that's what I think is locked up. But those press release aggregators are very important. Um, I also get millions of emails from uh, PIOs or uh, press information officers from universities, institutions into my inbox because they just know I'm a journalist. So they'll be like, hey, this came out. Hey, that came out. Hey, this came out. I mostly ignore a lot of them, but sometimes they're very interesting. Um, that took a while for that to start happening. Um, but you could always reach out, reach out to an institution and be like, hey, I want to be aware of what's coming out. Can you keep me posted? They can keep you posted. And then otherwise, just like listening to or like keeping track of your past sources, listening to seeing what they're up to, asking them if they're, um, you know, doing anything interesting and just looking around the news and look at uh, story ideas kind of more generally, I guess that's not specific to research papers, but I also get a lot of story ideas from just reading and talking to people and being a person in the world. <laughs> Does that answer your question pretty well? <laughs> yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I sort of have a follow-up question on that. And it's how do you, sorry, Luke, I totally jumped in on you. Um, it's how, like, how do you balance picking a story and the competing interests of like maybe what you find interesting, what you think the public will find interesting, and then what the scientist finds interesting. Like, how do you how do you navigate that? Yeah, that's one of the hardest things, honestly, especially like even as I as I learn, as you learn more about something, it almost gets a little bit harder because you're like, oh, well, that's that's whatever, you know, not that interesting. But to a, a lay person, they'll be like, whoa, that's crazy. I've never heard of that. That's unbelievable. But on the other hand, you can also get a better sense of, is this finding truly new? Is it really just a step, a small step in the, in like the general scheme of research or is it a big finding? Um, so as you get more familiar with, with a subject, um, uh, I think figuring out, is this incremental or is this like a real big change? 
um, I'll talk to my friends all the time and ask and be like, hey, I heard about this thing. What do you think of that? You know, um, uh, people who are not involved in science, asking someone who's not involved in science if they find something interesting, super helpful guide. But also trusting your gut. I think I've been getting more comfortable with this lately when I'm just like, oh, I'm interested in that. If I'm interested in that, a good portion of, the, of of people must also be interested in that. Some because there's some amount of people who also have similar interests like you. Um, so follow. So <laughs> yeah, it's not that's not a straight answer, but like listen to your instincts. When you really find something very interesting, someone else probably will too. Ask your friends who aren't involved in science and um, getting familiar with this subject area so you know what's what's a big step. And then another question. Oh. Go for it. We can do settings first. Um, okay. It was uh, when you're reading a science journal article and translating it to TikTok, how do you know, how do you try to cover the nuances of the study and its implications in a short video form? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll be honest. Some things, the story selection is, is sometimes as important as how we tell it too. Like there are certain things that we probably won't try to cover on a TikTok. I mean, it's not to say that anything could be in theory, but we try to choose something that we know we can get kind of the arc across in a short span of time. Um, I don't know. We do complicated things too. Basically, I would say read the paper, read all of, get all of your, all of the research, all of the information in your brain, go to bed, wake up, see what you remember. That's honestly one of the most helpful things is like that tells me I'm like, oh, I remember like that's that was important. That feels important. The things you remember are the things that probably that are the things that stand out. Um, uh, but then obviously reference your materials, make sure that everything's right. But that is one of the most one of the most helpful things. Editing down, you know, just like getting everything out and then shortening it a bunch. Um, leading with maybe your most interesting, exciting tidbit to grab people's attention, um, or a really interesting question that you'll answer by the end of the video. Um, I'll also say like, I think we typically don't go as deep into methods as often. Um, so it'll be a little bit more top level. We'll be answering like, what happened? How do they do it in brief? Why is it important? Those are like the three main questions to answer. So I had a question for you um, as you like navigate the ecosystem of science communication yourself, having been on the other side there, or as you see your friends and family go through, because as you mentioned, there are so many more ways that we get this information now. There's also a lot more miscommunication and misinformation. And so as you're seeing what other people are communicating, how are you watching for that in terms of how they're interpreting research? Could, could you rephrase that? Sorry. Yeah, sure. So like when you yourself are viewing a TikTok or a news story um, that's communicating scientific findings, um, what's going through your mind in terms of kind of reverse engineering how faithful they are to the actual data and information they're conveying? Hmm. I take everything with a grain of salt and I don't trust things. That I've like just learned not to trust things on face value. I'll even like, if I'm ever, if I hear something and I'm telling a friend, I'm like, this is not fact checked. I did not double check it. Or let me look up real quick before I like relay any information or share a video, especially if I'm, if I'm telling someone else to listen to this video, I'm going to double check it. Uh, honestly, it's, it's a le extra level of work that uh, most people don't do. And that's understandable. Um, I'll be thinking about like, well, once gut feelings were like, does this feel a little too good to be true? Um, does this feel like it's playing on people's like emotions heavily uh, or trying to rile up or like, a certain emotion of some kind? Um, are they showing receipts? You know, like this is the paper. This is the line. This is like references. Um, yeah, those are like some, some key things that I'll like try to pay attention to. And like, does the, who is this person? Do they have another, an ulterior motive? Is this what they do for their job? Is, are they a scientist or an expert? Um, are they trying to sell something? Yeah, things like that. Just being skeptical, skeptical and asking lots of questions. It's tough out there.
Any last questions before we jump into this show and tell? Okay, I have I have uh, one last uh, two questions. <laughs> um, I guess I was curious, one, like what makes a good scientific source? Like um, what characteristics, like when you're working with the scientists, make it easier, exciting to work with them? Like, is it about um, like how factual they are or like how excited they are or you know, something like that, that would make them be someone that you'd want to reach out to again to see if they have more exciting research coming out. Um, and then just a silly one, I was curious, like we didn't talk about podcasts, but what your favorite science podcast to listen to is that you think is like really interesting, um, but also like very uh, truthful and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Great, great questions. Um, to your first question, my favorite science sources, science expert sources are enthusiastic, just excited about their research, if possible. That's a, that's like a special sauce, extra exciting. Um, they know how to break down concepts um, and not use a lot of jargon. That's the best if you can get someone to stop using, you know, uh, it's really hard once you're like, you're steeped in the field. It's like, that's your language. Um, but that's part of like also how you interview them. And I, when I first was starting out, I'd like to, I was just like, oh, I'm nervous and insecure. And I want to, I like, I have a chemistry degree. I know what you're talking about. No worries. And I would get terrible quotes because I was just like letting them use jargon and being like, yeah, I know what that means, but the reader doesn't. And so essentially asking them to explain it to you, like you're five, um, uh, you know, like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Can you break it down a little further? But a, a subject who is enthusiastic, pretty well-spoken and doesn't use a lot of jargon. That's like really a winner. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, to that point also on the podcast and of thing, one of my favorites is ologies. If, if y'all are I highly recommend it's, um, Ali Ward interviews scientists and she obviously does a great job choosing the people that she chooses is that, that she interviews. Um, she probably pre-interviews them. So like for podcasts or video, you will often do a little interview before the real thing, just to like get a sense of how that person is, what information they can give you, what kind of vibe they're going to give. Um, and so obviously she does a fantastic job finding people who are excited and, uh, and great at talking about what they, what they do. Um, so ologies is one of them. I love unexplainable from Vox. Um, I'm going to have to do, I'll do a pl plug for our podcast. Honestly, we're going through an evolution right now and in a, come back in a month, three weeks, three weeks, we will have relaunched and it's, it's really going to be stellar. We have a new host TV, not, I can't announce just yet, but a new host. That's very exciting. Um, and let's see what else those are. I'm going to ologies and unexplainable are my faves. I'm, I'll probably think of another, but, um, there's some good ones out there. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, SciShow Tangents with Hank Green. That one's fun. I'm going to second the tactic of playing dumb. You get a yeah. lot out of it. You get so much out of it. And it like, took me a, a little while because I was just like, I want to prove that I'm smart to this person. But no, you don't. You want to prove you're very dumb. <laughs> so that they tell it to you more simply. <laughs> Not that, you know. <laughs> Great. Well, should we pop into a little show and tell discussion? Sure.